Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're fortunate to be joined by uh, Brad Bailey, who's uh, currently over at NASA Ames at the uh, NASA Lunar Science Institute. Uh, Brad's uh, a graduate of the Rose Holman Institute of Technology in uh, Indiana, where he can, uh, studied physics. Uh, he then went to uh, the VLA in New Mexico and uh, did a master's in uh, astrophysics looking at pulsars. Um, after that, he uh, turned his uh, eye back towards the Earth uh, and to things that are more relevant to uh, more people perhaps here on Earth. Uh, he went to Scripps Institute, uh, uh, the Scripps Institution at uh, San Diego, uh, where he did his PhD in uh, geobiology. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, the work that he uh, conducted on his PhD and uh, its possible astrobiological implications. So if you'll join me in uh, welcoming Brad. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Adrian, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, since I do work for the Lunar Science Institute now over at Ames, I, uh, thought, this I thought this photo was particularly relevant because the, the moon is right up here. And I also really like this photo because what it does is it ties in geology through, uh, here we have a bunch of lava flows from Kilauea uh, down. Uh, here you see the polys, and then you see the rainforest. Uh, and then you see this haze due to outgassing from uh, outgassing from the recent lava flows and really what this photo tries to do, at least what I think it tries to do, is uh, ties together geology, biology, atmospheric chemistry, and then ultimately looking out into the stars and onto the moon. And since I'm from NLSI, I think the moon represents all of the sky. So, um, <clears throat> and some people think that I have an overinflated view of my own photographic skills, but uh, I, I think this is one of my favorites. So, um, I'll let you be the judge. Uh, so again, another photograph, great photo of, uh, of some lava, some pohoihoi flows coming from Kilauea, uh, Pu'o vent uh, to, to a new lava entry. And um, basically my research revolved around using laboratory and in situ measurements to determine the role of bacteria in the weathering of basaltic glass. And ultimately I'll try to tie in some astrobiological implications into that at the end of the, st at the, end of the story. Uh, so, the, so why basalt? Uh, and there's a lot of rocks out there, but why basalt? Basalt is, uh, as you can see from this photo, it's a gravity bathymetry map from uh, Smith and Sandwell. Um, and it basically covers all of the oceanic basins. And in that, in those uh, ocean crusts, basically there's up to 20% of basaltic glass associated with those pillow basalts and dikes, et cetera. So, Another way of looking at that is here's a cross section of the ocean crust and you see the top couple, you know, maybe 100 meters or so of sediment and then you have these pillow basalts and dikes and then ultimately down, uh, down around, you get some gabbro and peridotite down near the bottom of the crust. But uh, these pillows and basaltic dikes have a lot of glass associated with them and glass is inherently thermodynamically unstable. And so there is uh, a lot of potential for energy associated with that for biological species. And prim primarily what, we're what I'm gonna be looking at is the upper 1,000 meters of the crust itself. So here's a cross section of uh, basically a sea mount or uh, a mid-ocean ridge and the type of chemistry that goes on at these mid-ocean ridges. So uh, what you have here is you have seawater being in sucked in on the sides of the mount or the or the ridges, and it entrains uh, magnesium and sulfates, but then it enriches the seawater and all these other uh, reduced minerals and elements. So of particular note, I wanna point out iron and manganese, um, but there's a lot of other stuff like helium-3 uh, sulfides, uh, hydrogen, et cetera, that get uh, entrained within the seawater and then ultimately spewed out in hydrothermal vents creating black smokers, which most of you have seen, I'm sure. And uh, and that basically creates uh, this region of a high thermal and high chemical uh, gradient uh, with respect to the surrounding seawater. Now, there's some theories out there I'm sure you all know about uh, in terms of like the Uri Miller experiment, primordial soup, how did life begin? Uh, but there's actually a growing group of theorists out there who believe that the origin of life actually happened deep within the oceans in these hydrothermal systems where there are these deep thermal and chemical gradients. So. Um, so that kind of leads us into what I'm actually doing. And so basically we're looking at the way that microbes are able to affect the dissolution of basaltic glass and ultimately live off of the glass itself. 
So what you see here are some photomicrographs of fresh glass, um, as you see here represented by FG, and then altered glass. This altered glass is ultimately pelagonite, which happens when fresh glass comes into contact with, uh, with seawater, oxygenated seawater. And what happens is the glass swells, uh, it becomes hydrated, and it also oxidizes. So that's why it's a darker red than you see, because all of the iron in that glass is becoming, uh, becoming oxidized. But when we start to zoom in on some, of these, uh, on some of these areas, you see this A. Again, this A is kind of a, stands for abiotic, uh, abiotic alteration. And that's typically along a pre-existing uh, crack within the, within the glass structure. But when you get a lot away from that, uh, away from that uh, pre-existing crack, you see this little area denoted by B. And basically what that is, you see a bunch of pits kind of represented here and here, and these tubes that are being formed into the basaltic glass itself. Now, there's no way that we know of from an abiotic standpoint to make tubes and features such as this. So you can really start to think about this as a, a bacterium sitting on the surfaces of the glass, and it's basically eating its way into the glasses and dissolving the glass uh, and releasing all of these elements into the seawater and utilizing some releasing the others. So uh, the interesting thing about these is these tubes can actually extend uh, several, or about 100 microns into the glass themselves. And if you think about it, microbes are typically on the order of you know, one to two microns in size anyway. So they actually work their way pretty far down into there. And there's further evidence for that, um, in that uh, microprobe analysis has shown carbon nitrogen, enhanced levels of carbon nitrogen and phosphorus within these pits and tubes. So uh, again, that's more evidence of um, uh, that these are actually created by microbes. So uh, these are some drill holes. Uh, these are drill holes that we took and looked at the percentage of biotic alteration of the glass. So if you take a look at these photos, you can say, okay, for here, you know, here's some abiotic alteration, uh, but it's dominated here by this biotic alteration. And uh, again, right here, you can see all this alteration. Sure, there's some abiotic stuff here in the middle, but, um, but here along the edges, you really see a dominance of biological alteration. So what we did, um, or what my advisor did, was looked at uh, samples from drill holes at different depths up to about 600 meters. And you see that in the top 200 to 250 meters, uh, the biotic alteration dominates the total alteration of the basaltic glasses. Uh, and, but after about 300 meters, it starts to drop off pretty rapidly and, uh, and until you get down to about 0% down around 700 meters or so. And that gets to the point where you've got a uh, very high temperature and pressure, which don't really allow uh, any biology to survive at that point. So the real question is why did, you know, ever get back to the basics, why are we doing this, what's the point? And so, um, you know, we are basically trying to figure out which microbes were present in these deep oceanic basalts and figure out um, why they're doing it. How are they, how are they actually performing these, uh, these little etching of the glasses? And there are several mechanisms that are being proposed right now. You can imagine a bacterium having a microenvironment around it that's highly acidic. And if, I, if, I, if you remember, I told you that uh, glass was thermodyna thermodynamically unstable. But it's also unstable away from neutral. So it actually dissolves in uh, high pH and low pH about equally. Um, so we're trying to figure out exactly how these bacteria actually dissolve these glasses away. And uh, like I said, there are actually several mechanisms that could be enzymatic, it could be passive, it could be active. Uh, we, just, we just don't know at this, at this present moment, but, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll know a bit more about it after my uh, colleagues graduate. Um, but anyway, so we also want to look at the chemical rate of transfer between microbes, glass, and seawater because microbes actually enhance the, the rate of dissolution of basaltic glasses and, uh, and ultimately seed the oceans with uh, higher elements. And also we want to know what are their limitations uh, with respect to energy sources, carbon sources, nutrients, etc. So we really want to get at what, is the, what are the limitations of life within the deep biosphere. Um, and uh, I already talked about that first one, but uh, the other thing is to start thinking about throughout the course of this talk is how do these, really, these environments compare with those we might expect to find on a subsurface Mars and Europa biosphere? Uh, you know, 
Mars has a lot of ultramafic rocks, a lot of high iron, high magnesium content, and uh, you know you do some heat flux calculations, you can start to determine at what depth you actually get water, and maybe we could see bacteria living off of the rocks down at depth within the Martian uh, subsurface. So uh, it's not necessarily what you do, but where you do it. So I went to Hawaii. Um, actually, I went to Hawaii, and my other two research sites were American Samoa and the Mediterranean. So um, I, did, I did quite well, but I'm not going to talk about Samoa or Mediterranean right now. And uh, instead, I'm going to focus on Hawaii, but if you want to talk about those others later on, that's fine too. Um, so we went to Luihi, which is the new seamount uh, coming up on the southeast flank of the big island of Hawaii. Uh, its, uh, its peak is around 900 meters depth still, so you know, no real real estate prospects quite yet. Uh, but you know, maybe in about 50,000 years or so, you might start to see it poking above the water. Um, and my other site is Kealakekua Bay, which is over here uh, just south of Kona. And the interesting thing about Kealakekua Bay is that it has a historical uh, record for an 1877 eruption. And that gives us a specific time point that we can look at for uh, how much alteration happens over you know, 140 years um, and, and what type of bacterial communities do we see associated with those basalts over that specific amount of time. Um, so again, here is Luihi grown up, uh, and we have a couple of different places. Here is Pisces Peak, which is, uh, which is the 903 meters, I think, depth. Uh, Marker 18, which is just on the, just on the rim of uh, Pele's pit, which is this uh, pit here in the south, and that's where most of the hydrothermal activity is going on right now. And, <clears throat> and so we have several markers deep within Pele's pit, and then we also have a marker down about uh, down about 1,800 meters at marker 17, um, down, down along the south rift. So what do we do? Basically, I need substrates to work with. I need these substrates that I can feed to my microbes so that I can determine whether or not the microbes are able to live off the basalt. So what we did was we went off to uh, Big Island, Hawaii uh, during an active, uh, an area of, or in an active, an area of active flow. And here is uh, Pu'o uh, erupting up here, which is great. You see this fresh, these fresh flows coming down the polys and ultimately down here into a, uh, into a new ocean entry. And what we did um, were we took a modified peat moss core and went in and scooped out fresh lava and just dumped it in a bucket of water. And basically what that does is it quenches the basalt right away and doesn't allow it to form any crystals and gives us fresh basaltic glass that we used as our background substrates for all of our, for all of our experiments. Um, from there, we went to Lawrence Livermore National Labs, where I worked with Rick Ryerson, and we created our own designer basalt, specifically around looking at nutrients or energy sources that we think the bacteria are going to need to survive in these types of environments. Uh, and specifically, uh, we looked at uh, iron, manganese, uh, and various oxidation states of both, as well as appetite, uh, a mineral, and I'll talk about that here in a sec. Um, but again, like I said, we design the glasses around the type of elements we expect to be metabolized out of the glass. So here's appetite, a uh, chemical formula. And you see this uh, large amount of phosphates within it. And so for the appetite basalts that I made, I added five weight percent of the appetite. Um, and for the manganese basalt, I added five weight percent of manganese too. <clears throat> the oxidized basalt, I went through and I crushed it up and then fired it at subsolidus temperatures around 750 to 800 Celsius in order to pre-oxidize the, uh, the iron that was within the glass matrix and then remelted it after that to, to produce an enhanced oxidized basalt. Uh, and then we have our normal basalt, which, uh, which we didn't change at all. And also we used rhyolitic glass, uh, which is uh, more silicious. It doesn't have a lot of iron associated with it, and that was one of our controls that we used. So here, again, are some microprobe analyses of the glass. Uh, normal oxidized, obviously you can read them on the other side. And the main things I want to point out here is during our, um, during our amending of the glasses, we had the phosphates. And as you can see, most phosphates are around 0.3% or so. Uh, our resultant glass was about a factor of 10 higher, around 2.2 2. 2 and a quarter. Uh, the same thing can be said for our manganese. Uh, we went from about 0.2 up to a factor of 15 or so higher, up to about 3.5. So we really uh, jacked up the amount of phosphate and manganese found within these glasses. <clears throat> 
And the same story can be said about the iron oxidation states. Uh, we performed some Mossbauer analyses of these glasses, and the Mossbauer, uh, well, we performed these uh, Mossbauer experiments with Christian Schroeder and Gustav Klingelhofer, who were the ones who designed and built the Mossbauer spectrometers for spirit and opportunity. So they have a lot of, uh, a lot of know-how and experience in this type of stuff. But um, here you can see sample two and sample four. Uh, we have, uh, this is iron two versus iron total. Sample two is our pristine basalt, which has about 87% iron two versus the oxidized basalt, which only has about 30%. So you can see we flip-flopped um, you know, abundances of iron two versus iron three in the two different samples. So, and then we took those samples and fed them to our microbes. And <clears throat> upon feeding them to our microbes, I'm sorry? Both, actually. I'm, pr I'm probably going to talk mostly about our laboratory experiments today, but we have a lot, we actually have a lot of these samples spread out throughout the whole world, basically. Uh, we've got a lot in volcanoes in Antarctica. We've got a bunch um, all over mid ocean ridges and several seamounts. Uh, so if you'd like to talk more about uh, that campaign, I'd be happy to a little bit later. Um, so, uh, so we have several experiments that we completed with those. And uh, first I want to talk about the iron, we have an iron two oxidizing bacteria, uh, which is on EM media, which is an artificial seawater media. So we can control what is actually, what we're actually giving to our microbes. Uh, we also have the same bacteria sitting on, uh, sitting in, this, in a similar media, but we took, removed all phosphate. So we wanted to really get at whether or not the, the bacteria could liberate the phosphate from the glasses themselves and, and survive in that fashion. Uh, and then the last one was we looked at an iron-3 reducing bacteria on anaerobic EM and then we, uh, we amended that with lactate as its primary carbon source. Um, so, the ox so the isolates we use in this study is uh, Pseudomonas, which we, uh, both, both of these isolates we isolated from the Weehee within the pit crater, uh, Pele's pit. And, um, and the first one, again, is LOB7. This is Pseudomonas, which is an iron oxidizer. It's an autotroph, which means it fixes carbon dioxide for its carbon source. And it's microaerophilic, so it likes a little bit of oxygen, but not too much, and it ne but it needs some to survive. And here's an SEM photograph of what this guy looks like when it's sitting on the surfaces of these basalts. So you see the cells sitting right here, here, um, you know, pretty much all over. But then you see these long, uh, these long iron oxide sheaths that they produce. As they go through and oxidize the iron, they, uh, they, spit the, they strip the electron off the iron two and spit the iron three back out, which ultimately oxidizes and uh, forms these you know, rust, rust sheaths, basically. And it just grows out of these sheaths as it, as it goes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The other, uh, the other isolate we used was a Schuonella. And the interesting thing about the Schuonella is that it's, uh, it's, very, it's 99% similar to Schuonella Wihika, which was also uh, isolated from, uh, from Luihi. Uh, about 10, 11 years ago, I believe. And it can also grow using various electron acceptors, uh, not only iron, but uh, manganese, uranium, chromium, cobalt, etc. cetera. Uh, again, it's a heterotroph, so it means it needs organic carbon to use as its, or, as its, uh, as its carbon source. And also it's an iron-3 reducer. So iron-3 is the terminal electron acceptor. Um, however, like I said, it, uh, it can use these others in that capacity. So here are the results from that experiment. Uh, the first experiment here is this LOB7 plus. So this is the Pseudomonas uh, iron oxidizing bacteria. The plus means that there is phosphate in the medium. And so in the artificial medium, there was phosphate, and so it didn't really need anything else. So basically, it preferentially sat out on the basalts uh, to get at the iron two that needed for its energy source. But relative to background, which is what these red lines are, um, you know, they, they definitely preferred to sit on the basalts, but there was no real distinct difference between each of the basaltic types. Um, <clears throat> Now, when we switch over into the medium which has zero phosphate associated with it, uh, you see that the bacteria actually, uh, this is number, this is percent of growth on the, on the surfaces relative to background. And, um, and so what you see here is that uh, you see a significantly enhanced growth of bacteria settling out and growing on the surfaces of the basalts, which AB stands for appetite basalt, 
um, with the phosphate. So it really, so what this is really telling us is that yes, they can liberate nutrients from the, from the silicate matrix and use them to grow and, uh, and ultimately survive in these types of harsh environments. Um, and a similar sort of story can be told for the Shuanella. It really saw the, uh, really saw the iron three as the electron scepter, um, acceptor as uh, beneficial and we saw a lot, significant amount of growth of iron of the shuanella on the iron on the oxidized iron uh, here's another way of looking at it um, although a completely different experiment uh, i took some microbial mats that we found there are these large seas of iron microbial flock uh, all over these hydrothermal vents down in luihi and uh, and so I took a small amount of that and inoculated some, some of these batch cultures with each of these different types of glasses and found that basically uh, the consortium itself preferred to sit out, to settle out and grow on the, on the basalts themselves rather than the background borosilicate um, glass or the surrounding epoxy that we use to, help to host our thin sections. So again, this is another more evidence that, sub, that substrate compos, composition itself is very key to uh, bacterial communities we see associated with these different substrates. Um, here's some more SEM photos of LOB7 and, and the difference between the glass epoxy, normal basalt, and oxidized basalt. Uh, here you see glass and epoxy. There's, uh, there's not a whole lot of biomass associated with the surfaces of these, but uh, when you switch over to the normal basalts and oxidized basalts, you really see a, a significant, uh, significant increase in biomass. And again, here are some more of these iron oxide sheaths. Uh, here's a Y where uh, a single bacterium splits and one of them went that way and the other went the other way. Uh, pretty, pretty fun stuff to look at. I really like SEM photos. Um, and in case you were wondering and having a hard time picking cells out of these, uh, arrows are pointing to individual cells on the surfaces. So take home message number one uh, really is that um, microbes are able to leach these nutrients directly from the basalts themselves. Uh, and, and really the amount of reduced iron, even in the oxidized glass, was enough to support bacterial growth uh, associated with those substrates. Um, <clears throat> And also, uh, like I said, composition really ultimately does affect the bacterial community structure, which means a lot so that if you go out into the field and pick up a rock, and it's a certain type of rock with a known chemical composition, then you can, not accurately, but moderately predict what type of bacterial communities are going to be associated with that surface. So here's some really neat stuff that I uh, published with Alexis Templeton uh, in Nature Geosciences. And these are, um, these are fresh basalts that we pulled from Luihi itself. And we uh, took a look at uh, the sections uh, and tried to figure out what the chemical compositions were of both the host basalts and some of, and some of the uh, ferromanganese crusts that were associated with them. So here is fresh glass around the outside, this uh, lighter material. And then here is this several micron thick uh, ferromanganese crust that's being formed on the surfaces. So what happens is the iron manganese gets sucked out of the basaltic glass itself and gets, uh, gets trapped in these crusts. And so we went through and um, took XLA fluorescence microprobe analysis images of these, and uh, we did calcium, titanium, manganese, um, and iron. And what you see is that uh, the, of particular note is that the titanium that leaves can get trapped in with the manganese portion of the ferromanganese trust. I think that's uh, significant. But also um, out here we have uh, the iron uh, redox states of of both the host glass and the and the crust, and so down the green is basically more iron two, red is more iron three, and you see that um, that these crusts are predominantly iron three uh, heavy. Uh, the purple is overlain with the manganese, so we can start to pull out, you know, where the manganese is happening. And so these crusts are actually where most of the microbial communities are actually being held, and that's actually where most of the activity is, is being performed. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with phylogenetic trees, but I thought I'd give a quick overview. Um, so there is this thing called ribosomal RNA, and we use the 16S for, for prokaryotes and the 18S for eukaryotes to classify uh, 
uh, how related one species is to another. And so uh, you start down here um, with the last common ancestor and, uh, and distance on this tree is equal to how many mutations it took to get to that point. So more deeply rooted, uh, more deeply rooted species are, are kind of more uh, primordial, I suppose, if that's how you want to put it. Um, but uh, the interesting thing here to note is that ultimately we are here, you know, animals, plants, fungi, you know, and everything that you can see biologically related is all entrained within this one little branch. All of these other branches all are single-celled uh, single organisms. So in terms of diversity, uh, there is, uh, we're basically dominated by the, by the prokaryotes out that are out there. Um, another thing to note on this particular plot is that the red lines indicate uh, uh, thermophilic bacteria. So again, uh, thermophilic bacteria you can see are all very deeply rooted and therefore are uh, a bit more uh, primordial than, than we are. So what is the diversity of bacterial communities associated with these ocean island basalts? And, uh, and how do those ultimately compare against the mid-ocean ridge basalts that, uh, that a lot of other people study at like Nine North, etc.? <clears throat> And so this graph is, or this plot is from Mason et al. 2000 and 2007. And what it is showing is that uh, these are the different species associated with, uh, associated with basalts from mid-ocean ridges. Um, in terms of archaea, they're primarily dominated by Crenarchaeota, uh, this, this large one here. Um, but, in, but most of it is bacteria. So all of this other stuff is bacteria. And you can see down here in terms of number of sequences, red being hotter uh, or higher number, um, the number of sequences of gamma proteobacteria and alpha proteobacteria uh, were, were very uh, much more enriched according to the others. And so that'll play an important part in some of these um, ocean island basalts that I'm gonna talk about here shortly. So what I did to characterize these bacterial communities, I used this, uh, a molecular microbiology method called TiraFlip, which stands for Terminal Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. I know, I know, I didn't come up with it. But uh, it is, it is um, a really neat high throughput method of looking at a significant number of uh, samples in a short amount of time. So instead of going through and doing cloning and uh, sequencing, you can actually get at a whole sample uh, diversity study within the single afternoon, which is fantastic. Um, so I'll just go through the process real quick and, uh, and then we can move on to the actual data. Uh, so pretend that you have three bacterial species in a, in a community. What you go through it and do is you extract DNA from the community and put it in this tube. And I think the most important thing to realize about this figure is that going from this step to this step was approximately two and a half years of my thesis. So it's, uh, it's not really an insignificant problem. There's, there's a lot of issues with extracting DNA from these basalt surfaces, including low biomass, there's humic acids, uh, there's uh, a lot of oh, activated hydroxyl radicals that can bind your DNA uh, to the surfaces of the glass and not release it into solution. There's a lot of issues associated with this, and uh, it seems like every time we turned a corner, uh, we ran into another problem. But uh, you know, two and a half years later, we get from here to here. And, um, and then what we do is we go through and do a, a polymer chain reaction. And basically what that does is it takes the DNA that we were able to isolate and we basically replicate it billions of times. So instead of having like three strands of DNA, we now have three billion strands and they're all the same strand. Uh, they're, all, um, or they're all similar. And so what we did was when we, when we uh, ran the PCR, we labeled one end with a fluorescent primer. So now every single one of those, uh, of those new strands of DNA have a fluorescently labeled primer associated with them. From there, we go through and use a restriction digest uh, or a restriction enzyme and cut the DNA at specific spots. So a restriction enzyme will find a tetramer or uh, a certain sequence within the DNA sequence and it will find it and then it will cut the DNA, the DNA strands completely in half at that point, uh, ultimately leaving behind the section of DNA that has the fluorescently labeled primer associated with it. So again, we have like ABC um, in terms of uh, bacterial species and now we have A, uh, which gets cut at this particular spot 
B gets cut at this particular spot, and C gets cut at this particular spot. So these D, E, and F fragments we don't really care about because they're not really, they don't, they're not tagged with the fluorescent primer. However, when you run them out on a column or a sequencer, A, um, <coughs> what you see is the shorter ones come out first. So C is the shortest, it comes out, it gets labeled. Uh, B is the next, uh, next shortest, and A is the longest. So A is the, takes the longest to come off the column. Um, and so this is a way of uh, A, determining which species are there, but also B, we can determine what the relative abundances are by looking at relative peak heights between A, B, and C, or you can also look at, uh, at peak area as well to determine, again, how, what the abundances are with respect to one another. So this is another way of looking at it. Uh, this is our 601R1 sequence, and I know most of you are probably getting cross-eyed looking at this. I know I did for the latter half of my thesis. But um, what I want to point out is that here is the fluorescently labeled primer region. This is a highly conserved region that uh, pretty much all 16S, um, pretty much all bacteria and, and uh, archaea actually have conserved within their, within their RNA. And so the primer comes in, finds this spot, and then sits down right on there and starts, starts replicating, right? So it just replicates the whole thing over and then and it splits apart and does it again. That's what the PCR does. So here's the fluorescently labeled, um, labeled region. Now we have BSTU1, which is a restriction enzyme. It's cut side as CGCG. So you have to go through this whole thing and look for this pair, CGCG, and find out where they are. And fortunately for you, I've done that for you. <laughs> and, um, and so every place that, that this restriction enzyme sees CGCG, it goes through and cuts where this slash is. So what happens is it goes in and it cuts at this spot right here. And then what we do is we start counting. We count from this spot here, this first T, and we count how many base pairs there are all the way up till this CG. And so that fragment length ultimately is 356 base pairs from that T to that G. And then we go into our T rifle pattern like I was talking about and just start counting over from zero and find out where 356 is. And oh look, there's a peak right there. So obviously Shuanella 601R1 is present within this particular sample. So the interesting thing here is that, um, is that each one of these peaks represents at least one uh, bacterial species. There may now certain, certain two different species may cut at the same site, uh, which it's it's happens. But the way to get around that is that you do this eight times per sample. So you do it with eight different restriction enzymes. So this is all the same hydrothermal mat from Luigi. But uh, and so each one of these peaks represents again at least one. But say this peak uh, has two associated with it that may get resolved into two separate peaks with a different restriction enzyme. So um, I know it's uh, not as fun to look at up there, but I like the blue color, it's pretty. So <laughs> anyway, so what we did was we went through some clone libraries um, and started comparing uh, what our clones looked like uh, in, with respect to our T-Riflet patterns. And our cl here's our clone library. And you can see that this one in particular is 547X3, which uh, I know doesn't mean that much to you, but is a hydrothermal influence sample on the south rift of the Wihi. So there is hydrothermal venting going on near there. And the interesting thing to note is that it is dominated by this gamma proteobacteria. Um, about by this single species, and you know there's there's a there's a suite of other things associated with it which represent all these other smaller little peaks. But here's this dominant peak associated with this gamma proteobacteria. However, and when you go off uh, go out of hydrothermal influence systems, you actually see a lot of uh, diversity start to creep in. So you still see uh, this. There's a lot of gammas associated with these, but you know you start to see um, you start to see some alphas and deltas pop in. And, and again, the, the others are a much higher fraction of the overall bacterial community associated with it. And that's represented, again, here in, the, uh, here in this tier foot plot where you have, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, dominant peaks associated with it, whereas this one, you know, you only have one or two. So um, that's one way of getting at, looking at these tier foot plots and trying to pull stuff out of it. Um, and this is another way of looking at that last plot where we took the, uh, we took these clone libraries and just did a uh, computation within the computer to figure out what would 
this, what would these clone libraries look like if we plotted them up in a tRifflet pattern? Um, and, uh, and, <coughs> and you can see that there's, there's pretty good overlap. You have, you have uh, similar clusters all over the place, uh, here, 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 and here. Um, and, you know, and so you really start to say, okay, now we can accurately start assigning each of those peaks with specific species that we have pulled out in these clone libraries. And so, and that's what we've done here. Uh, you see that uh, here's this dominant peak. Uh, I use primarily BSTU1 uh, because it, uh, it tends to cut the most and be, it is the most selective in terms of all the restriction enzymes according to Emerson and Moyer. Um, but uh, here is, again, is that dominant peak. Um, it's a gamma. But uh, you see a lot of other alphas and gammas. Here's a planktomycetes, uh, nitrospira, acetobacter, et cetera. Um, but <clears throat> what, you're really, what we're really trying to point out is that these uh, bacteria associated with these ocean island basalts are very similar to that plot I showed you earlier in that uh, they are dominated by alphas, gammas, betas. Um, you know, here's some more gammas. Uh, here's a delta. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is this uh, zeta right here, uh, which is a new uh, bacterial species that we found on the Weehe, and it's uh, ultimately going to have its own proteobacteria classification, which we're pretty excited about. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll actually show an SEM of that a little later. From there, we're able to compare T. rooflet patterns uh, across different samples. And so here are three different rock samples. Um, here's 549X3, which is, um, which was uh, the uh, south, off the south point of Loihi, um, or I'm sorry, off the south point of the island of Hawaii. Here's 552X2, which fr was from Kaila Kakua Bay. And here's 546X1, which is at marker 18, which is up near the summit of, uh, of Loihi. But again, I think I'd like to you notice that here is the, um, here is the, hydrothermally influenced sample, and you can see there's only two dominant peaks here, um, whereas all these others, or these other two samples, uh, were not near hydrothermal samples. And so the bacterial diversity associated with just open ocean basalts is actually significantly increased uh, versus hydrothermally influenced samples. Um, <clears throat> oh. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that you can, so if you line them up like this, you can, you can see different ones, uh, different, uh, different strains start to uh, be more dominant in different types of environments. So here's this alpha over here, this little peak, uh, pretty small with respect to this gamma, et cetera. But you get over here uh, into Kaila Kakua Bay and you see this peak you know, really ramp up with respect to everything else. And so the alphas actually dominate uh, dominate in this type of environment, whereas uh, over here the gammas do. Uh, but you can also line them up and say, okay, here's gamma here, here's this gamma, and here's this gamma. And so in this sample, it's very much uh, a primary player as opposed to this one where it's, uh, it's not quite as, as significant as this one or some of these over here. Uh, <clears throat> and so here's, again, I'm trying to compare basalts versus mats. And so, again, these basalts are sitting underneath these very iron-rich microbial mats sitting on the surfaces. And, and the very interesting thing to note is that the, the mats themselves are, from a community, bacterial community standpoint, significantly different from those of the rocks. So, again, here is uh, this X1, uh, which is a rock, uh, and you see these two dominant surfaces, uh, or these two dominant peaks, but over here on the mat itself, again, 546R1 um, for the mat, we actually see a significant uh, growth up over here. Um, and, and we really, we really uh, need to start characterizing the differences between the mats and the rocks themselves in order to start telling the full story. But the real thing I want you to take away from this is that basalts themselves host a different bacterial community than the surrounding environments because of the substrates themselves have, uh, can potentially uh, affect the community structure. Um, and uh, to do one more quick comparison, we have uh, non-hydrothermal high, high diversity, again high diversity, high diversity, and then hydrothermal low, di or, and then in the hydrothermal systems we have low diversity uh, associated with these two different rocks in the hydrothermal systems. <clears throat> 
So I know you shouldn't read any of this, but basically what I want you to see is that uh, this is just like another phylogenetic tree, but what it's doing instead of comparing bacterial species, it's, carrying, it's comparing complete uh, bacterial communities. So it's comparing one sample, one complete bacterial community of a sample with another. And so uh, you can see that these two are obviously pretty related. These two are pretty obviously related, but these guys um, are pretty deeply rooted right here and compared to these. So these guys are not necessarily as closely related to these. And of course, these guys are completely different than all the others, um, this, this clay down here. And so the one thing I want to point out is that's really interesting is that upon plotting it up like this, we, uh, we see that this whole group right here was taken in cold, low temperatures. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, they may have been hydrothermal mats, but they were all, they were all 10 degrees or colder in terms of uh, the temperature of the hydrothermal mat or hydrothermal fluids coming out. Um, and then this group two down here, which, is, uh, which ultimately is a high temperature, which was about 20 degrees Celsius or higher. And that's, that's we're calling it high temperature for the purposes of some of the bacteria, in terms of uh, the bacterial mats and uh, fluids that we were seeing on the Weehee. Um, the hottest we ever saw was about 95 degrees in terms of the fluids. Um, but most of them, you know, if they were elevated temperatures, they were, up, they were around 20 to 35 or so. So again, the, so by plotting them up and looking at the phylogenetic diversity of each of these communities, you can really start to pull out that, uh, that, you, have, uh, that you see significant differences between these. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out is here are the rocks. And the rock, uh, the rock types are, um, are located here, which again is fairly deeply, deeply rooted. Um, and again, here's this one. So it means they are fairly significantly different than all these others. And so the rocks themselves are different than the mat samples that we took that were corresponding uh, in, in corresponding locations. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is uh, some of the samples that we got from iron rich mats on Nafanua, which is Vailu seamounts on the Samoan hotspot uh, plot up really nice in here and they are very, very similar to some of these mats, uh, both cold and hot, that we were finding on the Wihi. So that's basically telling us that uh, these, uh, these bacterial communities are fairly cosmopolitan across different seamounts and, uh, and what you find in one might uh, very well, uh, you might be able to find in another. So here's the take home message number two. Um, really, uh, what I want you to note is that uh, there's a lot of high diversity associated with relatively uh, with non hydrothermal systems in just regular open ocean basalts. But uh, hydrothermal, hydrothermal input actually fairly uh, does a very good job of selecting which bacteria can actually live in that type of environment. Um, and, and as a result, we saw the low diversity associated with those samples. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is that T. Riflip and Clone Library information, when you add them together, actually are a pretty powerful tool for characterizing large, uh, large amounts of samples of um, basalt-hosted bacterial communities. Um, so if we want to just tie it all together, uh, really, uh, you know, the deep ocean biosphere, which DOB is, that's not date of birth, as someone else pointed out to me earlier, um, is, uh, is, is kind of in its infancy. Uh, it was, there was a lot of, uh, there's actually about 20, 25 different groups that are out there looking at this right now. When I started my th thesis, there were maybe four. Um, and so uh, there, there has been said that, uh, that the amount of biomass associated with this deep oceanic biosphere uh, rivals or surpasses the amount of biomass associated with the continents. So there actually is a significant amount of biomass associated with these types of um, environments and, and really in order in order to figure out uh, how you know the transactions between seawater and basalt crust and atmosphere are going to happen we really need to understand how these bacteria ultimately um, ultimately seed the oceans with these uh, with these elements from the from the crusts um, and that's all you need to take away from that so Again, so let's come back to why is this important. So here we are back at our uh, back at our phylogenetic tree of life. Um, again, you know we're here, and here is the last common ancestor from which you know all life supposedly originated. However, um, the interesting thing is that 
uh, a recent paper came out talking about the late heavy bombardment of uh, in, her, in the Earth-Moon history, and and what they what they suggested was that even the greatest impacts uh, back four billion years ago were not an, were not large enough to sterilize the surface of the Earth completely. Uh, so so any any life that had formed up to that point could have survived within the oceanic crust and been relatively sheltered from these large impact and sterilization, surface sterilization environments. And so that's particularly important because if we do have these bacteria that were ultimately living, um, that were ultimately living back at that time, then they were likely the ones that were surviving deep within the, o deep within the ocean basins. They were, they were harvesting minerals and, and nutrients directly from the rocks themselves. And so it is possible that these bacteria were our last common ancestor. Um, but the interesting thing about trees of life is you never know, you can't really date trees of life. And so it is possible that our current tree of life ultimately is just an offshoot branch of what happened from the original origin of life, where you had the origin of life and then you go up and each of these red lines represent extinction events. And so there, there may have been some stuff that just grew completely out here, but then we had a large extinction event and, uh, and completely wiped this side of the tree completely out. Um, and, and there are also other possibilities that maybe there are some guys living way down here that we just aren't able to recognize. We just haven't figured out what type of life actually exists out there on our world. And maybe some of these guys are still alive. But as we know it, this, our, the, current, the tree of life as we know it um, actually is, you know, could be part of a larger system that we just don't know about. And again, these extinction events may have all been the same one, uh, you know, large impact, snowball earth, um, and, uh, and there's not a lot of buy-in to Snowball Earth anymore, but it is a potential kill mechanism for, uh, for a lot of these different species that may or may not have existed. Um, so anyway, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of the people that I worked with, that worked with me on this. Uh, and um, I think of particular note are the captain and crew of the uh, research vessel Kaimikayo Kanaloa and the Pisces Submersibles. They were, uh, they were fantastic, did a lot of stuff with us, um, got to go down, uh, see some amazing things, bottom of the ocean, um, and also funding from NSF and Agaron. But I'd like to close off with, um, with a couple more SEM photographs and really start looking at uh, what these surfaces actually look like in situ. And, um, and remember I said I'd come back to that Zeta uh, proteobacteria, uh, proteobacteria, and this is actually the zeta itself, and it produces these little curly Q iron oxide structures, which uh, which are found elsewhere, but not specifically by this, um, which are not found specifically by this bacterium. Um, but you see, you see these uh, the cracks in the surfaces of the basalts, and but you do see cells and uh, and these iron oxide structures, um, all sorts of EPS and whatnot. And uh, here in the center is you know, our last common ancestor who very well could be your great times 10 to the 13th grandparent. So, so be, be nice to those guys. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Brad, if I could start the questions uh, with, uh, what, what are the sort of chances of preservation of these uh, of biosignatures that you'd be able to recognize? these bacteria in these basalts. Well, if you were to go to Mars and you were to find a similar basalt. Sure, so there's, well, my advisor would tell you, I'm not sure I buy in, but my advisor would tell you that uh, there, so in, we have cratons and in ancient ophiolites, we actually see textural evidence of these that actually predate our current uh, 3.8, or limit of 3.8 billion years of uh, life on Earth. And, um, and so some, so we go back and see these at 3.9 billion, but again, they're only textural evidence. You know, they've, they've since been filled in with, um, they've since been filled in with uh, secondary authogenic minerals, uh, such as titanite, uh, you know, iron hydroxides, or iron oxyhydroxides, et cetera. And so um, from a textural standpoint, it is possible that you could go and find those guys on, on Mars. And if you can come up with a good, um, a good abiotic uh, way of producing those uh, tubules, I would be more than happy to hear them. Um, but uh, they're, they're basically you just have to buy into the fact that those textural evidences are abiotic, or they're biotically made, and then you can start making those inferences. So 
Um, oh, but and there's also some other stuff that uh, I forgot to mention in that uh, there was some DNA staining of the uh, pits and tubes, and actually they did find they do find uh, small bits of DNA uh, embedded within the within those pits and tubes. I'm not suggesting that those are 3.8 billion year old DNA strands, but uh, you know there there is DNA uh, in addition to the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphates that we do find uh, within those pits and tubes. Wanda Davis, NASA Ames. I'd like to follow up on that mm -hmm. uh, with respect to biomarkers in uh, ancient, um, sort of the pillow basalts that one can find along the Scabland. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone looked at that and seen if there's any difference between the oceanic current and what we have in, in that ancient realm? Um. Uh, it's very easy to get to. Sure, sure. So, uh, so these actually are found pretty much in any, in any ocean basalt older than about 10,000 years. Okay, so it takes a little while for these things to form, but then all the way out to, you know, 73 million years, uh, we can, uh, the, the oldest uh, ocean crust out there, um, at least I think that's what it is, I my numbers might be off a little. Um, we do find we do find these. So, but then for these, like I was saying, these ancient ophiolites, we do find similar textures, in, and they're similar in both length and and size. So, so where are they from? Is my point. Oh, from uh, Pilbara. Oh, they are from Pilbara. Yeah, I yeah. see. Um, so that's where that's where Hubert, my Hubert Sodigal, my Thank advisor, you. did all of his uh, his field work as well. You focused on the glassy basalts mm -hmm. as a surface where you might find these. Uh, what about the slower cooled crystal, crystallized basalts? Would you expect to see any uh, biotic alteration? Uh, you do see biotic alteration. There's actually a couple of papers out there focusing on uh, pits and tubes actually being formed within olivines. And uh, of course, there's a lot of olivines uh, embedded within, uh, you know, morb. And so, uh, so yes, there is. But the main reason that we focus on the glassy parts is because, uh, of course, glass, the, re the way glass forms is it gets, it gets quenched, doesn't have time to form crystals. And, and predominantly, it's those glassy bits that have been exposed to the water and therefore ultimately exposed to, uh, exposed to, the, water, to the water and the, the bacteria. So um, it's those outside rinds that, that are, I would say, the more dominant features uh, when you look at bacterial communities associated with basalts. So you talked about temperature and chemistry of the seawater being mm -hmm. the two most important variables with respect to which bacterial species would be present and how much diversity there would be. Has anything been done looking at the relative ages of the different basalts and whether specific species tend to colonize first and another set of species a certain number of decades or, or millennia later? Sure. So actually, um, that's, uh, that's actually a great question, and it's one that I've been looking towards uh, using or let me start over. That's part of my thesis work, but it didn't actually make it into the thesis because it's obviously on time scales that are a little bit longer than the typical thesis, at least. Well, mine was pretty long, but I, I had a good time at sea. I'll just say that much. Um, but so we, we, we designed these experiments to where we put them out in uh, 10 at a time, basically. We would put out 10 of these different experiments, then we went back after one year and plucked one out. We went back after five years and plucked one out. And, and then... Um, and unfortunately, the samples are still sitting there waiting for, waiting for either me or the next graduate student to come along and analyze. But then the, what we do there is then we start looking at the initial colonizers. Who are the ones who settle out on the basalts first? And, uh, and once we start figuring that out, then we can start figuring out, okay, who comes in later and starts living off of like the EPS that's generated or the organic carbon that's generated from those initial colonizers? And at what time do we really start to see significant alteration of the basalts? I mean, you still see some, um, you don't see the tubes in the young basalts like I was talking about, but you do see some etching and some, uh, some initial uh, dissolution of the, of the basalt surfaces. Um, 
And, and again, we do have another time point, like I was saying, from Kealakekua Bay, which is 140 years. And then we have Loihi, which we have dated uh, uh, with paleomagnetism at, you know, a couple of thousand years. And so, and so then we can combine that with some of the uh, work that's being done out of Katrina Edwards' lab down at USC, who are looking at uh, progressively older rocks moving away from mid-ocean ridges, uh, going obviously uh, away from the ridge and um, looking, at, looking at the bacterial communities associated with that. But the short answer is, it's a great question. It's something that needs to be done, but it hasn't been done yet. question so uh, how do you date the bacterial um, uh, invasion of the rocks uh, like you know it could come quite some time after the rock has been formed itself so. it's very possible you yeah. you just don't know it's don't know <laughs> they could have gotten there they could have been those initial colonizers or they could have come along a lot a, lot, a while back or a while on and I think that's part of, that kind of feeds into that last question is we really want to uh, we really want to start doing that characterization of and of progressive ages so that we can start pinpointing which bacteria arrived at which point in these different types of environments. But um, you know, as as for as you know, I, I don't think we could say for certain exactly when they showed up. Um, yeah. In in one of your earlier slides, you showed how the seawater is ingested into these vents and then mm -hmm. is expunged. What's the time scale? For that process, is it a second, a day, a um, year? It's it's on the order of of. Uh, that's a good question. I, I honestly don't know. I'm just gonna, you know, spout you a number just to get off the hook. Um, I, I'm I'm gonna say on the order of hours. Um, you know, it's because they the water actually comes from come, comes from fairly deep. Um, and it's got to move. It's got to move a fairly long distance. Um, um, Katie, do you know how long that takes? Yeah. So I, yeah, I think it's on the order of hours because I mean, you've seen black smokers and it's coming out of there at a pretty good pace, but it still has to go from all the way out at the, at the, um, at the bottom of these. All right. That's probably a better way of doing this. That I'm just, you guys get to sell my slides again. So I mean, the water really is coming all the way up from you know all the way out from here, you know. And it's getting pulled all the way up through, and it's got a lot of time to react and get loaded up with all those reduced minerals. Um, but I really don't think it's, I don't think it's more than days. It's, it's more than a second, but it's, I, I'm, hours. That's my answer. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's no further questions, Brad, we have a small token. Oh, we oh, have one more. Uh, do you see any uh, gas bubbles? in the basalt and subsequently analysis of such. Right, uh, we, okay, so um, usually the, guy, the basalts that we're looking at are fairly deep um, and so there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of vesiculation associated with those um, just because they're, st they're still under a fair amount of pressure and, uh, and don't actually expand out to make that. Um, uh, so, that's, that's the short answer in terms of the stuff that we look at. However, uh, there is stuff that's been, um, that's been uh, created near the surface or on the surface. And when you actually go in, it's pretty interesting. You actually see a higher amount of bacterial counts on the inside of some of these vesicles uh, because they are protected from the elements and et cetera. And, uh, and so, you know, at depth, again, there's no bubbles, but, um, we do see, uh, well, actually, that's not true. I'm, okay, I'm going I'm to tell you this little story just for fun. Um, in Vailu at Samoa, um, we actually witnessed uh, liquid CO2 being ejected from the volcano. And again, that was, that was about 800 meters depth or thereabouts. Um, and that was, that was actually really fantastic. Um, so we did see that type of stuff being created, but within the rocks themselves, um, at least at the depths we're talking about, there, there's, there's no real vesiculation. Right, uh, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, there's a SETI type in. Ah. Uh, 
wear it with pride to your next uh, trip to Hawaii and don't drop it on a sea mount uh, okay. leaning over the I'm side of a ship or something I'm like that. I'm not going to lie. I'm probably not going to take a tie to Hawaii. But, right. uh, but I appreciate this. That's awesome. Thank you very much. You'll join me in thanking Brad for his great talk today. Thank you.